Hello everyone, I'm Chrissy B and this is the Chrissy B Show, the UK's only TV program that's dedicated to your mental health and well-being. Now controlling our emotions can feel difficult at the best of times, never mind in the workplace. What do you do if you're in a team at work that isn't functioning very well or you're in a position of authority and are expected to keep it together all the time? Well, if that rings a bell, we have lots of advice on our show today with our resident guests and they are Coach Chris Brown who'll be giving five tips on how not to let emotions break a team down. And we also have our resident psychologist, Dr. Audrey Tang, who will tell us all about the different ways in which we can control our emotions in high pressure environments. Helena Shard will be on hand to give us this week's positive news in Behind the Fame. And for our good cause of the week, we feature Happy Fall, a mental health and wellbeing magazine on a mission to create a healthier and happier society through inspiring life stories and positive news, which is exactly what this show is also about about too. Now we also encourage you our lovely viewers to go out and try new things because that can help to relieve stress. So we feature Big Mo's Diner. We'll be treated to a performance by Ozona of Believe It To See It and I'll be letting you know how I manage my emotions at work. Now, according to Mind Charity's Guide on Managing and Supporting Mental Health at Work, one of the core management behaviours needed by line managers is the ability to manage emotions and to have integrity. But with one in five of us feeling unusually tired every day despite having a full night's sleep and the number of people working excessive hours in the UK constantly rising, there's inevitably going to be a lot of emotion to handle. Well, we wanted to hear how some of you are getting on managing your emotions, so we took to Twitter to find out. Bethany Ainsley says, we all face stress at work. What matters is how we manage it. Creating clarity of thought and shutting off distractions is one technique. Work on wellness say, mental health at work. Be there for your team. Candy Steve found an interesting way to de-stress at work. She says, and here we go, having to rest on my office floor again. A couple of ice packs and rest hopefully will do the trick. McDonald Herbalist says, just had enough of a break to choke on some yogurt and oats that was supposed to be my breakfast. Well, thanks very much for your thoughts. And if you have any comments that you would like to make, please do email us on info at chrissybshow.tv. But before we speak to Audrey, let's take a look at this. I entered a career in oil trading where I worked for some of the largest companies in the world for around 20 years. And obviously, as one can imagine, trading any commodity or financial instrument is very uh, stressful. A lot of money is at stake. But I think what happened to me was, although I found the job extremely interesting and exciting and fascinating and fun and rewarding, um, I focused, again, very much on trying to be a perfectionist, which is essentially impossible in the world of trading. And uh, for better or worse, I focused on the side of trading, which is really speculative, basically trying to predict the direction of, simply speaking, the oil price up or down, which again is almost impossible to do with any great degree of consistent success, and obviously lends itself to making many decisions which are immediately judged by the market and can immediately be viewed as right or wrong. And when I made a wrong decision, I would really get down on myself, I would be incredibly uh, self-critical, self-flagellating mentally, uh, it would lead to me to often go home at night, and this is when I was in London or Geneva in the early days, and uh, lie in my bed and cry perhaps, or just lock myself away and just dwell on the negativity, and I felt such a, a worthless failure. And these periods would be relatively um, frequent and um, consistent, maybe once every couple of months. I Usually they'll get over them in 24 to 48 hours max and then simply go on my way again. Um, I actually viewed it in hindsight as saying that maybe during this time in London and Geneva, I was maximum suffering from depression and feelings of worthlessness and sadness, all consuming sadness, um, about 20% of the time max. Now in 1990, I moved to the States and since then, I've looked back in hindsight and said that my depression to non-depressed ratio switched completely and it was more like 80% depressed, which is obviously very serious and troublesome. Again, the trading was very stressful. I would focus very much on the, the negativity of my failings. Foolishly, I tended to focus on the speculative side of the business, which is absolutely not necessary and many, many people are extremely successful without uh, putting themselves under the stress of that type of speculation. But for whatever reason, I think I wanted to prove that I could do something which 
was almost impossible to do and which was incredibly unsuited to my personality, which was one of great self-criticism, negative thinking, uh, and uh, desire for perfection, because I tend to think that in my childhood I was always expected to be largely academically perfect. Thank you very much for that video. So now it's time to speak to our resident psychologist, Dr. Audrey Tang. Welcome to the show, Audrey. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Chrissy. So emotions at the work in the workplace yes. get really yeah. out of hand sometimes. They really do, and we need to talk about them and find ways for managers and people who are sort of in the support area to support those emotions at work. Yeah. Largely because we are um, a tertiary industry. In other words, in the UK, we tend to be more service orientated, and yeah. um, we don't manufacture quite as much anymore so a lot of what we do is customer facing mm -hmm. and the thing about customer facing jobs is that you were always having to not only know your job but create a certain feeling in the other person as well so if you take the example of a teacher mm -hmm. they don't they, they, I mean they need to know how to teach history they need to know the history of whatever it is the a-level syllabus needs them to do but they also need to manage the situation if a child is upset because they have something yeah. going on at home or they're suffering mental health issues or anything could be happening a child's very angry and all of that emotion is thrown back at that teacher mm -hmm. Now, what they have to do is manage their own emotions so as not to yeah. <laughs> create any kind of um, eruption, as well as continue with their job. So what a lot of these professionals do, teachers, nurses, managers, doctors, anyone who's customer facing, your customer service assistant, they will all contain the emotions of the other person. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to do a little bit of a demo here. I've yes. got a sponge and, <laughs> and right, some no water. Problem. If you imagine the water is as if that's that's emotions of other people mm -hmm. and your frontline um actually i probably shouldn't say the word frontline that has been criticized before but that was the term used in research to describe customer facing staff okay. but customer facing staff um is they the sponge so so they're getting emotion thrown at them all the time it's mm -hmm. quite easy to mop that up and to yeah. contain that however the more the emotion they have to contain the more and more the sponge gets saturated. So if you get to the point where you're containing so much emotion, mm -hmm. but you haven't had a chance to release that, and then more emotion okay. gets thrown at you, yeah. you're making okay. it worse. Mm -hmm. So the whole problem with emotions at work is that they are such an integral part of the job itself that we do need to support staff in managing those in a constructive and helpful manner. Okay. How might those things be? What are the, some of maybe the, the tried and tested ways of maybe managing those emotions? Um, having a backstage area for staff to relax in is really important. Okay. And actually, it's where people like cabin crew have been researched. and. Sometimes, especially on short haul flights, the only thing separating them from the passengers is the curtain. <laughs> and I know it myself, I've just popped behind, you know, got any snacks, hi, you know. <laughs> and that's a little bit, that's encroaching into their downtime, really. Yeah, yeah. And that will be the time where they are sitting there going, oh gosh, that passenger in seat, whatever. Yeah. And they should be allowed to do that because if they cannot release the emotion they've been holding on to, they can't serve with a smile yeah. later on. So yeah. having a backstage area, same things with staff rooms or private areas for staff to be in. So often, especially in schools, I know that students are able to just knock on the door and come into the staff room and that can be quite difficult because staff need a place to discuss things and yeah. you know things might be written on a whiteboard there if they're dealing with certain issues. And that can be quite um, hard for staff mm -hmm. to, to cope with. So it's about organisations realising staff need that sort of space. Okay. Um, other things, of course, are providing uh, either mindfulness training, although mm -hmm. unfortunately, whilst it, it, it has been shown to work and reduce stress in the places that really subscribe to it. A lot of people, and I read an article um, just the other day, they said it's a bit of a, a lunchtime mindfulness. It's a quick fix. It's yoga in your, in your lunch hour. Mm -hmm. And that's not enough for staff okay. to really relax. Yeah. So it's, it's about understanding that they need that time. Also, um, other tried and tested things are communities of coping. A lot of the time, um, people form bonds with those that they work with. So if this uh, research was conducted on 911 callers, so it's American, mm -hmm. and it was late at night, and they were the night shift, and they got all kinds of things. They got some really horrible cases, but they also got your 
I'm a bit bored and I've got nothing else to do, so I'm going to ring up 911. Okay. But what they found was staff there formed such a bond together and that got them through the night and that mm -hmm. allowed them their release of energy okay. and they were able to take the calls appropriately later on. Yeah. For managers, it's as important to have either somebody you can talk to, other managers, colleagues, to not use your team as a form of therapy or not use your clients as someone that you can express too many emotions okay. to because whilst you do need to show some humanity because yeah. obviously that's that's important about building uh, in terms of building rapport if you're kind of gushing all of your private life <laughs> that can be quite quite off-putting for clients or yeah. anyone that you're you're yeah. dealing with so it's about organizations realizing that a backstage area a private area that's really private mm -hmm. for staff is very important knowing that staff do want to make friends mm -hmm. with each other and actually encouraging that and that means things like managers not joining them on their weekly nights out if the staff yeah, want to go out and bond let them do it okay. without the fear that the manager is going to be listening okay. um, mindfulness if you subscribe to it properly and encouraging staff to maybe get out in your lunch hour that sort of thing yeah, as well I'm not taking breaks like I have to do with my staff sometimes go for a break precisely go for your breaks <laughs> So you mentioned something like, you know, it's, it's okay to show some kind of emotion. Yeah. It's just about getting that balance. So what kind of emotions are, are good to show maybe well, at work? The emotions that are great for customer facing staff to show are anything that shows their humanity or mm -hmm. anything that can build that rapport to make the other person feel in the manner they that, that, that makes them comfortable. Okay. Um, there was a very fascinating piece of research done. This is way back in the 60s, but the same thing is true of today. Um, and it was done on nurses. And what, what they found was that nurses wanted to go into the nursing profession knowing that they would have to show compassion to terminal patients. Okay. They knew they would probably form those attachments. But what the organisation did was they actually started changing shift rotors so those nurses couldn't form those attachments. Mm. They couldn't spend more than two weeks on a ward. And the nurses said, but... We we do understand this. This is why we've chosen this career. Yeah, so exactly. if you have chosen a caring profession, you want to be able to show that nurturing, yeah, yeah. show that caring. And that should be absolutely fine. And people go into that knowing they want to show it. Similarly, um, people who go into a sales assistant job, they want to do it because they love talking to people. Mm -hmm. They like being bubbly. They like smiling at people and giving them a script to just say, hello, how are you? You like feel robot. it's robotic. <laughs> They it's do true. it's robotic and yeah. none of what you've hired is allowed to come out. So mm. a lot of the time it's about allowing people to show their personality because that's the reason you hired them. Yes, but trusting them in that they know their professional boundaries as well. Brilliant. Audrey, thank you so much. Pleasure. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you. Well, everyone, after the break, we'll be hearing from coach Chris Brown, who will be giving me five tips on how not to let emotions break a team down. And we'll be treated to a performance by Ozona of Believe It to See It. But first, how much do stress-related absences in the workplace cost the UK economy per year? Is it A, 2.3 billion, B, 23 billion, or C, 230 billion? Tune in after the break to find out. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show, everyone, your TV program for things related to mental health and well-being. And today in particular, we, will, we are speaking about managing your emotions in the workplace. So before the break, I asked you how much do stress-related absences in the workplace cost the UK economy per year? Is it A, 2.3 billion, B, 23 billion, or C, 230 billion? The answer is B, 23 billion. That's 105 million days lost per year as a direct consequence of stress in the workplace. So we see that we need some advice on dealing with stress in the workplace and here to give five tips on how not to let emotions break a team down and how to work effectively with your peers is coach Chris Brown. Welcome to the show, Chris. Hi, Chrissy. Lovely to have you back on. Pleasure being here, always. So what do you think of those stats there? Quite high, you know isn't that's it? That's very high, that's mm. very high. And you've got to think about it as well, the amount that's actually lost through that in revenue yeah. and for the company as well, it's, it's mm -hmm. pretty high at the end it of the is, day. You yeah. know, you think about it. That's why we need things in place. Yes. And we need and you're five going to help us. Yes, I am. Yes. Now, the thing about it is, it's funny, because when this came up, um, I was having a discussion with someone about this who's in business and all that. 
And I remember myself having to go into company and deliver training mm -hmm. on different areas. And one of them was about teamwork mm -hmm. and about, funny enough, you mentioned about time off and sickness and all that. Mm -hmm. But there's usually um, certain models that we deliver which um, actually help put it in place and see how it goes. And I was having a discussion with my wife, Hazel, as well, and she, by the way, says hello to you. Oh, hello, hello, Hazel. <laughs> right. And um, yeah. we were talking about it because obviously her background is NHS. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what sort of role, what sort of um, model have you got in there as well? And I was comparing it to the models that we have outside. And the one we came up with, which I'm going to talk about now, is this one that they've called HEART. Mm -hmm. Now, when I talk about different models, we're talking about things like a how to actually deal with emotive behavior instead to get mm -hmm. the staff to work together as a team, these sort of things. So there's different steps. So that acronym and heart actually goes through each area that actually helps. Now, I personally believe this is not only for the NHS, it should be rolled out everywhere, you know? Yeah. So let me just tell you what it is, right? Okay. So we're talking about heart. So let's talk about the letter H. What we're talking about is honesty here. Mm -hmm. H, honesty. Now, when we talk about honesty, we've got to think about, let's be transparent with people. If you're transparent, whether you're the manager or the staff, it's going to make a big difference to relationships, to trust mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So you've got to be transparent, be truthful. You know, there's ways of delivering the truth. It's how you deliver it, but mm -hmm. be transparent. It makes all the difference, right? Okay. So we're talking about the E now. And when we talk about E, we're talking about equality. But because I've delivered a lot on that area, I said, well, look, you can't talk about equality without talking about diversity as well. And you've got to think about it. Now, we're talking about here, particularly London, it's quite a diverse place at yeah. the end of the day, right? So equality and diversity, it's really important in how you actually treat people, um, looking at the differences in a way of catering for all. Mm -hmm. everybody's need at the end of the day. Let's put it this way, catering for everybody's need. That's right we're saying, right? Because we may say, um, well, let's just say it's lunchtime and everybody here, and I'm based here, and let's say I grew up here and I just like fish and chips. And I said to everybody, come on, I'm going to pay for you. We're all going to go fish and chips and all that. Hey, some people don't eat fish and chips. Some people don't eat saveloys. Some people, yeah. you know, but someone thinks I'm being good about it. So we've got to be aware. Yeah, of how we actually treat people in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. So equality is really important. Now the A, we're talking about accountability. Mm -hmm. Now automatically when you think accountability, you think of your own responsibility in that sort of way. But it's not only, you've got to take accountability if you're the manager, if mm -hmm. your name's on something, you're the one everybody goes to. So you've got to be accountable. Think about this, this show, right? Chris CB, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking mental health. Anything that goes out there, they're seeing your face first. They're coming mm -hmm. to you and talk to you about it first at the end of the day. But yeah. everybody's a team. Mm -hmm. So you're accountable for what happens at the end yeah. of the day. So we've got to work that out as well. Make yourself accountable to every situation, especially if you're the manager on there. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't work in teamwork. You've got the manager who's accountable. Something goes wrong and we pass it off on that person. The reason why it's happened is because of them. Instead of talking about it with them and then take the responsibility as leading, which makes a great team in okay. that sense. Yeah. So where are we? All right, let's talk about R, right? We're talking about R and that is really important. Respect. Mm -hmm. Respect each individual for who they are. Respect the work. Respect what they do as well as vice versa in how they respect you too. Mm -hmm. So then we're finishing off with team, which goes right back to the top at the end of the day. We're talking about teamwork. Now, teamwork is working out everybody's strength. Now, I haven't said the other bit. Strength, because if you worked out everybody's strength, you should be able to pull a great team together. You think about marketing, mm -hmm. right? You've got a team in your office, marketing. There's somebody who's really brilliant at graphics. There's somebody who's brilliant at IT. There's somebody who's brilliant at the PR and going and talking to somebody. These people, their strengths, pull them together. It's gonna really work. So that's what we're talking about team. Support, supporting each other within this team at the same time. So if you recognize each strength, you support it, build it up, and allow people to actually be able to express themselves and their ideas. Because sometimes you get leadership where this is the way it goes, that's the way it goes. But if you can actually motivate from behind mm -hmm. and bring out the ideas of everybody, it's a great team, it's a great yeah. team. 
Because of course, Chris, that is more obviously to do with prevention and, and like yeah. you know keeping a team together. What if what if a team has actually already started breaking down or they're already having arguments? What 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 can you do maybe as an individual and also as a manager to help that team gel back together? Right. Well, work when the team has actually broken down. When you've got to get to the point of it, and we talk about the same thing of transparency. You've mm. got to get to the point of it because that person might be expressing themselves in one way, but there could be something completely different that was minute that grew from nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, it's wrong of me to say nothing. It was something to that individual. Mm -hmm. So if you can get to the root of it and uh, let's say mediate with the two and just be honest, you know, sometimes we've got to take off our titles and our caps to actually get down on the level with somebody and say, well, this is what we think, this is what so-and-so is, this, that, and try and get them to get to compromise in where they should and be honest about it. It's mm -hmm. the worst thing that can happen is somebody holding back and the other talking and you go out the door at the end of the day, it was great in front of you, but there's still those little grudges underneath. It doesn't yeah. work. Work. So it's being transparent, you know, being able to mediate with both sides at the same time. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Chris, thank you very much. Pleasure, Chrissy. And we shall see you again very soon. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, so now it's time for a special performance by Ozona of Believe It to Sid. And if you are a performer and you would like to showcase your work here on this program, please do contact us on info at chrissybshow.tv. Let's go to Ozona. Inside of you, look a little deeper. Abraham told me, Let it go, fears are growing weaker. The fire burning in my heart when my eyes close. This time I'm ready and I know. very much to Ozona. So after the break, Helena Shard will be here to give us this week's celebrity news in Behind the Fame and we'll see how Pax Brown got on when he visited Big Mo's Diner in central London. But first, in workplaces where mindfulness has been introduced, by how much have stress levels reduced? Is it A, 2.8%, B, 12.8% or C, 28%? Tune in after the break to find out. Hi, I'm 
Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10 p.m. on my channel Sky203. Visit chrissybshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back to The Chrissy B Show, everyone, the TV program that looks after your mental health and well-being. Now, before the break, I asked you, in workplaces where mindfulness has been introduced, by how much have stress levels reduced? Is it A, 2.8%, B, 12.8%, or C, 28%? The answer is C, 28%, as well as a 20% improvement in overall sleep patterns. We're here to help us take our minds off work and onto some good news is Helena Shard in Behind the Fame. Welcome to the show, Helena. Thank you, Chrissy. So we do love to have you on because you never bring well, here. even if I would say even if we talk about bad news, but it's always got yeah, a positive spin in the way people have um, helped one another and things mm. like that. But your news is very positive oh, all the time. Thank you. And I love doing it. Good. Which is great. <laughs> um, so starting off with something which I found quite magical and it's mm -hmm. just something very simple. Uh, Lots of people turned up to, Hi to a concert in Hyde Park mm -hmm. and it was to see Green Day, their, their yeah. performance. And Green Day were late on stage and there was something like 65,000 people. So everyone was feeling a little bit like, oh, what do we do? Anyway, they started singing Bohemian Rhapsody. It started. Mm -hmm. And then 65,000 people were singing it really loudly, just, just mm -hmm. you know, dancing, really getting involved. And it, just was the most amazing someone captured it and it was okay. it was on it went viral but it was just the most amazing thing that everyone and people went from being agitated to so quite euphoric so it started um, with probably one person or yeah. a group, small group of people didn't you know that just maybe probably changed just the whole mood and of, just of everything just completely changed the mood yeah and really really magical so something so simple yeah and singing is always good isn't it um, moving over to, so Prince George is now four, mm -hmm. he's much, much bigger, time I have to flies. say, time completely flies. So we've seen the official uh, royal photo that was um, put out yeah. to everyone and people were saying, oh, it was a little bit boring, but I actually thought it was great, it was really animated and mm -hmm. fun and a good time because he's about to start school. So he's not going to know what's hit him. So he's actually going to a private day school, mm -hmm. probably along with lots of other little boys and girls that are starting. It's called Thomas's Battersea. And the school states the most important rule at school is to be kind. Oh, that's, that's their nice. one motto, yeah. to be kind, which I thought was quite symbolic. That's nice. Um, and uh, moving on to Lady Gaga, because that's something as well that she always talks about. And a while ago, I'm not quite sure when, completely but she started her foundation born this way foundation uh, with, the, with the view of empowering young people mm -hmm. that they can make the change um, okay. which is really good and sort of fostering a more accepting environment and now she's sort of pushing that tool that it's really cool to be good and kind mm -hmm. which is she's winning That's with nice, which, is, yeah. <laughs> which is good isn't it it's really really good so um, mm -hmm. just that very simple I think she's good she's a good girl um, moving on to something, I don't know whether you saw it, which is Princess Diana, her life and legacy, which was on ITV with the boys, I didn't, I didn't watch the princes. It, but, yeah. I mean, I think there's been lots of things that were released about it prior, but it was just so interesting how they have taken, I mean, obviously they loved their mum and they wanted to show how brilliant she was and how much mm. she did for everyone. And they've taken that role on now in such a positive way. And just how fantastically funny she was, and so how many breath of fresh air, and how many causes she really, really yeah. helped hugely. So it was she did. It was, she I really mean, did, she really did. She, yeah. she was really empowering, and I think there's lots of people. It's really funny because there's lots of people who are pro or against. There's no sort of in between ground. Well, you can't please everyone, can yeah, you? Really? No. <laughs> but um, and one little thing they were saying that they were one thing that they were so sad about is that they would when she rang. It was the last call how desperate they were that they didn't speak to her for longer. Because mm -hmm. they were kids, weren't they? And they just wanted to play. It was like, oh, mm. mom, you know, that kind yeah, of thing. But it's just they, one they of those small things. Yeah. But it was just, it was very positive. And yeah. it was lovely, lovely yeah. to hear. It's just so nice to see them speaking about her so much now. Because yeah. you didn't really hear much yeah. at all before and now. And just, yeah, that it's her it. legacy and everything, which mm -hmm. is really positive. Um, obviously, Princess Diana had an eating disorder, as, as we know. Mm -hmm. and, and moving on to Panorama, which really, really good. Um, 
Men, Boys and Eating Disorders, uh, which is interesting, and it was hosted by rugby referee Nigel Owens, mm -hmm. who's had an eating disorder for years and years and years and years. I um, don't know exactly how many, but it's been an ongoing battle for him. And it was lots of moving accounts, uh, boys and men, of how they cope with it, because obviously it's seen as a, a female it is. problem. Mm -hmm. Um, so just talking about it and seeing these young boys and, and you know, mm -hmm. trials, tribulations they go through was really very positive. Sad, obviously. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that roughly 1.6 million estimated people are affected by it in the UK and around 400,000 of these are, are thought to be men and boys. I bet you there's a lot more because people don't Yeah, talk. obviously, there's it's, always it's a lot more than what stats say because people don't, some people just yeah. don't want to talk about but it. I just or, found they're, it. or they're in denial themselves. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just found it really, it was really empowering and apparently top sportsmen um, are prone to develop eating mm -hmm. disorders. Freddie Flintoff as well, oh, who's somebody who's talking true. about it. Um, so yeah, that was good, very good. Mm -hmm. um, moving on, but also the thing about body image. And I was doing lots of research and the only thing that was coming up was Love Island. Now, I don't know about you, <laughs> really? I've not been watching Love Island, no. but it's <laughs> set in Spain or something. And you know, these supposed perfect people with their perfect bodies and looking beautiful. So they're obviously cast for certain things and the media's talking about them nonstop. Mm. So especially young children, they're just gonna be comparing themselves yeah. to, to these people. And I don't care about yeah, I, I, mean, I used to be, when I, I know when I was a teenager, it was really like a, a, a big issue for me. But like I said, even though like I did all the training, I got the body that I always wanted, but I was still unhappy. Yeah. So it wasn't really about the, the image, really. I thought yeah. it, I thought it would Control. be, but when I got what I wanted, it wasn't it wasn't mm. that. But it's, now it's like I really, I'm just happy with me. And good, that's a good place know. to be. Yeah, it is. I am, I was, too, I was watching something today, and they were saying how like some women in their forties are uh, uh, they don't know themselves anymore, and they're insecure. And I'm thinking, I think we that's we get to know it ourselves. Better, better and we're more mature and we're more sort of grounded at this kind of age, I think, anyway. I, I do about too. you guys, what you think. Here, here. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, we should um, love ourselves the way we are. Yeah, we absolutely have to love ourselves. And uh, moving on again to body image, uh, mm. Owen Bigwood started losing his hair at 17 and his dad did, Roger, and Roger decided to buy his son a hair transplant, which okay. he got when he was 18. But he, he was saying that Towie made him horrendously self-conscious. That's um, Only Ways Essex yeah. program again, probably a little bit similar to Love Island in a, a roundabout way. Um, and again, he feels so much more competent for, for having it. Mm. My personal opinion is he looked better before. But really? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. but, it suits know. some people without I think so, hair, it? too. It looks... Yeah. Anyway, it's, um, but it's a shame that it's, again, comparing yourself to, yeah. to other people. And if yeah. you're young, I can see how yeah, you're looking. It does, yeah. It's going to infect you. Um, so you need we need role models, and there are quite a few role models, even Vicky Pattinson, Pattinson? Yeah, yeah. Vicky, who's a reality star, and she's now 29 and urging women, you know, you've got to accept and embrace your body. Mm -hmm. um, she was trying to achieve the unachievable, that was yeah. the thing, and I think lots of people try and do that and get a bit silly. Um, mm -hmm. She's now become a celebrity body positive ambassador for a, an underwear brand. Mm -hmm. And the thing she said, which is so true, she, you need to learn to be the best version of yourself that exactly. you can be, and that's it, that's, isn't that's it? That's what I'm saying. That's all you can do. And, and so what if someone's got a six pack and, you know, you don't quite achieve it? So what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, you know, Don't need six Work packs. with what you've got and get it the best you can. Yeah. That's it. What can you do? <laughs> I know. So, um, also Dawn French, but good, well done to her. She's mm. lost eight stone, been very sensible about it. She tends to put on weight. Yeah. Um, but it's a sheer determination and eating well because she was doing it. it wasn't that she disliked her body, but she was doing it for health reasons. Yeah. So great. That's Good really for her. Weird. Yeah. That, that's when it's actually, you kind of maintain it better when you're yeah. actually not just doing it because of yeah. the way you look, but it's other, you've more other, reasons than that, yeah. I think. Absolutely. So she's done well, looking, looking amazing. In fact, yeah. I was reading an article and it says, breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dine like a pauper. Yeah. And that's how you can lose yeah. weight. I need to work on that BMI. last one. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, me yeah. too. <laughs> um, moving swiftly on. Moving swiftly on. <laughs> away from the food. Um, being mindful when taking selfies. So actor oh. Paul Nichols, who used to be in he's now mm. 38 he decided he was going to take a great um, trip out to Thailand which he did on a fabulous holiday plunged down a treacherous waterfall oh what was he doing oh he was taking a selfie oh, no. so he, he was on his motorbike he you know luckily parked up left his bike there but he fell down he was in Koh Samui which is very 
good place yeah. to go. I'd love to get there actually. He was actually rescued three days later because somebody noticed his bike was there oh, and it hadn't been taken. But he was survived on drinking stream water. He had to uh, battle soaring heat and obviously deadly wildlife oh that could have got him. But he smashed his kneecaps and everything. Good thing is they found him and he's recovering in hospital. But you know, it was all about the selfie. Oh dear. So, I mean, we know selfies are good, but, but you've got don't. to live in the moment and enjoy what you're yes. doing and not just do it for social media. Exactly. But he's he's recovered. Oh, well, that's good that he's recovered and we I need know. to leave it on that note. Thank you week. so good. much. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see you again next week. Thank you. Look forward to it. All right, guys, so as you know, we're always on the lookout for exciting places for you to go. So here we feature Big Mo's Diner in central London. Thank you very much. Would you like a tuna or takeaway? Uh, we'd like to eat in, please, yeah. Thank you. Wow, so here we are at Big Mo's Diner. It's a completely 50s themed venue. It really feels like you're in the 50s. In fact, one of the first things you eat is welcome to the 50s as you walk in. The food here is very enticing. We've got a menu that's completely dedicated to lunch and dinner and another one that's only dessert. Beautiful, thank you so much. So here we go, the first course is a selection of sliders. It's three miniature versions of the signature burgers. All right guys, now I've had my main course and we're waiting for dessert. So while I'm waiting, I'm just gonna have another quick look at the menu. So obviously it's a classic American diner. We've got loads of burgers, we've got ribs, we've got chicken wings. We've got some beautiful sharing platters actually, which are suitable for up to 12 people, I think. They also have a great selection of salads as well and something like, you know, grilled chicken you can get as well with salad on the side and that's really, really light. Beautiful, now here's the dessert, another one of the signature dishes. So remember guys, it's important that you're always trying new things, because it improves your mental health and well-being. Try new things, try new activities, visit new places, because it really, really does you good. Hi guys, so here we are at Oldgate East Big Mo's Diner with Saha, the duty manager, who's gonna answer a few questions for us. So Saha, hello. Hi. There you go, so what is Big Mo's all about? Tell us. Okay, well, it's a family diner. Um, our main focus is to just get everyone to come in, uh, whether it's kids, families, business people, um, we welcome everyone. And it's about having a nice comfort space, um, good food, good, uh, amazing desserts, yeah, that kind of place. So who comes to Big Mo's? What's the kind of customer you get here? Well, in this branch, uh, we get everything, because we're banging the city. So we've got tourists, we've got students, we've got families, uh, business people from Liverpool Street, all around the area. So every type of customer we get. Thank you so much, Saha. So there you go, guys. Big Mo's Diner, Saha, the duty manager. <laughs> Bye. Wow, Big Mo's. Lovely place for family, group of friends. Great food, nice and fresh. And they even got a private function room if you want to have your party or your private event there. Give it a try. Bye, guys. Thank you very much to Big Mo's Diner and to Pax there. Well, after the break, I'll be hearing from our Good Cause of the Week, Happy Fall, a mental health and well-being magazine on a mission to create a healthier and happier society through inspiring life stories and positive news. And I'll be letting you know how I manage my emotions at work. But first, what percentage of employees experience some degree of conflict in the workplace? Is it A, 65%, B, 75% or C, 85%? Do you know the answer? Find out if you're right after this break.
Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show everyone where today we've been talking all about managing your emotions in the workplace. Now before the break I asked you what percentage of employees experience some degree of conflict in the workplace? Is it A 65%, B 75% or C 85%? The answer is C 85% of us. Well as you know we love to feature good causes on the show and today I'm very excited to be joined by Jake Hamilton of a mental health and well-being magazine called Happy Fall. Welcome to the show, Jake. Thank you for inviting me, Chrissy. It's lovely to have you on because this magazine, I think, is absolutely brilliant because you're basically doing what we do on the show <laughs> in magazine form. So obviously, there's, a, there's already a connection there. Yeah. So tell us, how did Happy Fall actually um, come about in the first place? Uh, how it came about is really interesting. So our owners and our founders are sisters called Amy and Emma. Mm -hmm. um, when she was a little girl and coming of age, Amy uh, had obsessive compulsive disorder, mm -hmm. um, OCD, and, but she didn't know she had it and she didn't know what OCD was yeah. and she was very private about it as well. So she didn't tell her sister, she didn't tell her mm -hmm. family, she didn't tell her family doctor, she told no one. Um, at the same time, her sister was having these same feelings as well. Oh really? And oh. she was private about it and they didn't tell each other. So when they were adults, um, they, uh, Amy started to look onto the internet to find more about her condition, mm -hmm. OCD. Um, and there was nothing there, this was about 12 years ago, so there's not really a great wealth of information. Yeah. And I think she said like she, she probably found more about OCD in Hollywood movies than on the website. Yeah. So there was a gap there. And obviously being entrepreneurs, they saw the gap and they thought, well, let's fill it. Let's create a portal mm -hmm. where people can go to seek advice and help in a yeah. personal, providential and a confidential um, uh, manner uh, where well, you don't have to tell your doctor because nine times out of ten your doctor is going to be your family doctor. Yeah. So the key thing was confidential so it's a place where people could go and they could be linked to a counsellor or therap therapist in your area mm -hmm. and it was called a counselling directory. Yeah. So they started it and almost immediately they realised that there were tens of thousands of Amy's and Emma's and then there were hundreds of thousands of Amy's yeah. and Emma's and uh, it, the business just blossomed and I think they are so to date they've helped about a million people wow. but underneath that manifesto um, the, 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 they wanted to help the people um, communicate their feelings mm -hmm. and to express their thoughts um, and basically to break down the stigma of mental health in society yeah. so um, I mean, that was sort of their main goal. And they've, so they've created this directory and they thought, well, what can we do next? And they thought, well, we can do content and we mm. can make accessible content. And they were like, let's make a magazine. And that's how it came about. That's how it came about. And so it's quite new, isn't it? When, when did it actually It is new, launch? yeah. We launched on the 20th of March this year, which okay. is the International Day of Happiness. Yes. Uh, we are five issues old. Uh, so we're very new, we're very young, um, but we are passionate. Mm -hmm. um, we're kind of unique um, because when you, when you say mental health magazine, people can sometimes go immediately, like, that's going to be really serious and it's going to be heavy and it's going to be great. That's what they think about this show before they actually watch it and see how much fun we have as well. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, but we don't want to do that. Yeah. We, what we want to do is we want to create a magazine that's like fresh and exciting, like yeah. a lifestyle magazine. Yeah. So it's mass appeal, mainstream, middle brow, mm -hmm. uh, with exciting content. Um, and I. So, the, so the, the sort of editorial values of it is we want to promote good mental health yeah. and prevent bad mental health. Yeah. So that's me as an editor speaking. But if I'm, if I'm in, if I'm in the, uh, the pub or a restaurant or on the street um, and I, people ask me about the magazine, I just tell them um, it's about the things that really matter in people's lives, mm -hmm. you know, that really matter. So it's love, relationships, family, sex, death, money, society. Mm -hmm. And pe because they're real things, and because mental health is a real thing, people instinctively know that they're connected, and yeah. that's what we want to do with Happy. Brilliant. So how's it been going so far? What's the response been like? Am I, amazing. I've read one of the Yeah, magazines. amazing. Great. I mean, yeah. we're small, you know, we're a minnow, we're new, so we have to box clever because, yeah. you know, we're a consumer magazine, mm -hmm. and there's already a wellness market, and obviously yeah, exactly. there's, there's the women's glossies right there, and there's, the, you know, the interior decor, and then there's the vegan, so it's a very <laughs> sort of proliferating market, yeah. but the wellness sector obviously is coming but um, the response has been amazing because mm -hmm. we've got we're doing something slightly different so that the feeling that the people have got to it they they seem to feel very warm towards it because yeah. like a sense of belonging and also um, 
we want to speak their language, you know, yeah. we want to speak the reader's language. And, and you actually working for, for this magazine, how is it for you? Because obviously it's not just the magazine, like there's a lot of magazines out there, and I'm being honest, you know, that it's all about gossip, it's all about sort of maybe yeah. negative news, but to be able to do something like this that's positive, that's actually helping people, raising awareness about certain things, how yeah. does it feel for you actually it, being it's involved? It's incredible. I mean, I've been an editor of magazines for about 17 years now, and I've been mm -hmm. a consumer. Uh, editor, so I've been involved in, like, as you said, lifestyle in the men's market, yeah. and the, the 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 best things I liked about those these kind of magazines was the human interest, and the rest of it is just like, oh, you know, purple's the colour of this year. Oh, and there's ten places you can go and get a vegan burger. And after a while, magazines are cyclical and they go yeah. round, yeah. but with human interest, it's it's bottomless. Mm -hmm. You know, and so f interviewing people and talking about what people are doing in terms of social responsibility, I always enjoyed that. And then mm -hmm. when Happerful came along, I'm like, the entire magazine is this. Like the, the whole website is this. This is like this is about engaging with people. This is about total yeah. communication. Yeah. So it was like, I'm never going to get bored because oh. it's not it's not cyclical. You know, isn't it lovely and uh, loving your job though? <laughs> I mean, I we talk my, about we talk I about this on the show as well, like how important it is to actually enjoy what you're doing and you know, yeah, it's absolutely. really meaningful for you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What about future plans, Jake, for the magazine? Where do you see it going? Um, well, uh, <laughs> crystal ball. <laughs> well, I mean, 2017 has been like a real watershed year. You know, we've yeah. got the, the two princes coming out talking about grief yeah. Yeah. and about that they sought counselling. There's mm -hmm. actors, there's sports people, there's pop stars and they are speaking up and talking about things that have happened in their life and I'm not going to suffer in silence and mm. the resonance of that is amazing you know we choose our celebrities and as a society and they're the vanguard when they speak about speak up about it people automatically think oh well, that's really brave it helps me as well so mm. we want to be a consequential magazine in a year's time like the most mm -hmm. consequential mental health magazine and our website we want it a place to come where people can share experiences with yeah. consequences that's what Brilliant. we want you know um ordinary people with sharing their extraordinary circumstances like yeah. we are not alone Brilliant. Jake, thank you so much and all the best for the magazine in the future. I'm sure we're going to be he hearing more from you. Thank it's you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, everyone, don't go away because now I'm going to be covering my own tips on how I manage my emotions at work. So let's get straight to my tips, everyone. The first one is I make sure that I look after my health. So it really does start with the prep. So I make sure that I eat right, I exercise, and I do try to get enough sleep. I aim for about seven hours a night so that my performance isn't you know, impaired in, in any way the next day. And I don't also stay up late working into the early hours um, because that I don't think that's very productive and good for us. And I actually had a friend that used to do that. She would stay up till like three or four in the morning working. And in the end, she had a bit of a breakdown and it took months for her to recover. Uh, so instead of actually her saying, I have too much work to do, um, this is too much for me at the moment, can I get some help? She kind of just tried to plow through and tried to do everything. And it really, really did affect her mental health and her physical health afterwards. She's recovered now, thankfully, and she did learn from that lesson. But I do try to you know, make sure I look after myself and make sure that the preparation is good. I notice, for example, that if I don't eat well or I've had like a particular day where I've, I've not been good with my food, I do actually feel very lethargic and I don't feel good. Um, and that obviously can affect my concentration as well. So I do, you know, looking after health is, is one of my priorities. The second one is I make sure that I wind down. So though I always have a lot to do when I get home, especially after even recording here in the studio, and a part of me says I need to continue working, I need to keep doing something. But I know that I need to, to wind down. So what I do, I sit down with my husband, we talk, we have a laugh. I, I tend to leave my phone in another room as well. Um, because I, I think it's just important to be, just be away from the phone and just have that time with your family, your loved ones. And you do need to recharge your own batteries. And the third one is, I deal with situations quickly and openly. Now, something actually happened at work and I something was said to me and it was something that really, really hurt and it really shocked me. And I, at the time, it was by email and at the time I was very, I felt very upset and very emotional. And I knew that if I phoned the person or, or saw the person at that particular time, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be good because I needed time to sort of process what had been said. I needed time to think about maybe my part in, in everything that was said. So I, I left it basically, I slept on it, had a chat with my husband about it, 
and, and I just left it for, for the next day. And then I, you know, I, I called a meeting with the person. In the end, we sorted it out. It was a, a bit of a misunderstanding, but I also learned from that situation for myself. We were, as Chris uh, mentioned earlier, about the honesty part of things. That I, you know, the, the person expressed themselves, I expressed myself, and we were very, very honest with how we felt about things and what was going on. And in the end, everything was fine. We sorted it out. So um, you have to kind of fight, find the right timing. So. If, as I said, if, if you'd sometimes if you deal with things there and then, as soon as something's happened and the emotions are heightened and everyone's upset, it could end up being really bad. So you should kind of leave it to when everyone calms down and has a, a chance to think about something. But also don't leave it too long because that's when things can also start to get confused and there's more misunderstandings happen. So make sure you deal with it in the right time, not too quickly, but don't leave it too long. Do it as, as soon as possible when you feel like, you know, you're not angry or upset. And also do it openly. Make sure there's a chance for everybody to speak and express themselves and things will get sorted out. The next point is, I like to think. Now, I, I'm always looking for ways to make my work more efficient for myself and for the team. So a lot of the times I'm, I just like to spend time on my own and just think, okay, how can I be more efficient in what I do? How can my team be more efficient? And there are times when I have ideas and in our weekly meetings, we actually sit down and we discuss them or in one-to-ones that I have with my staff. And you know, sometimes it's a small thing that you can think of that can make a whole lot of difference in just a small thing that you work in the way that you work that can really make things more efficient. So it's good to, I know, you know we're busy and we have lots to do but if you just take even just 15 minutes just to be away from everything and just think about your work and think about how you can tweak it here and then and how you can change things around it does really make a difference and the final point is I do speak up when I need to. So for example, if um, things are getting too much, I feel that I'm not managing my workload and maybe more things are coming, then I, I have learned to say no to certain things. And also things, for example, that I feel maybe not be very productive, then I will, I will always speak my mind. And also, um, I do tend to speak to senior management quite a bit. When I, when I have ideas and I want to suggest new ways of working, I do make those suggestions. I don't always get a yes, but at least I tried. But some things I do get a yes on, and then we can go ahead and work in a new way that is actually more effective for the whole team. So those are my points, and I hope they've helped you in some way. Well, everyone, we have reached the end of today's programme, but don't forget if you have a story that you would like to share or you would like to contribute in any way to this programme or you have a comment about something that you've watched here. Maybe there's a programme that particularly helped you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us on info at chrissybshow.tv. You can also tweet us at chrissybshow or leave a message on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. Until next time, bye-bye for now. Don't fill up the time, Chris. You've still got a minute Did and a half. Really? Yeah. You I could have carried on talking. Oh, we didn't have, we didn't put the time with you. I could have on talking. Let me just do this link to break. So the first one is. Nothing, nothing at all.